and that, and I believe as coaches, that's what we're that's what we're paid to do. That's what we're interested in, is is in maximizing performance and excellence. So this uh, these are the areas that I hope to address today. Eleven areas of coach communication, uh, having f the coaches actually work together and talk the same language. I've noticed how rules rarely work, uh, and I can go into that. And then the process of correcting mistakes, and then with uh, our athletes, where we are constantly looking at building up their confidence. Sometimes there's a uh, uh, we can either correct mistakes or we can identify low self-esteem issues or possible conflicting information vectors where the player is getting information from the coach and then getting information from the dad and eventually the player goes into paralysis because it's impossible for him to make everybody happy, especially dads who are giving him uh, disempowering language and coaching. And then um, and then there's a final piece, uh, piece uh, coaching in the zone, which actually uh, Dr. Saul Miller initially got me started on looking what that uh, looks like. Now, Saul's a sports psychologist, and we work together in Los Angeles. He's uh, written Hockey Tough, uh, Performing Under Pressure, many, many good books. <laughs> Saul, are you on the line? I am, I am. Well, you know, and I'm honored to have you here today. Usually I'm listening to you. Well, it's a pleasure, Morris. Keep rolling. Uh, Saul, sure. and Saul's just, I just wanted to introduce uh, Saul Miller. Morris met him, uh, connected with him years ago, and uh, got some help and uh, got him over the hump in uh, terms of getting to his higher performance state years ago. And it's really nice having Saul on. Saul, you're in California, are you? I'm in the desert in Southern California. Gosh, it's about 30. Yesterday was 35 degrees. Okay. And it's a good place to do some virtual uh, connecting with people. This whole adventure, of, uh, of empowered coaching and also empowered performance. I believe for myself started when I was a young boy, we were just out on the baseball diamonds competing and having fun. And um, I was very, very lucky that uh, I had an amazing mentor and that was my brother, Ed Lukowicz. He's a former cur uh, world curling champion. Uh, Saul has worked with him, uh, Ed, uh, actually at one time was the very best curler and had the very best curling team in the world. He was very innovative, uh, smart, and knew how to do things. And then he actually became a coach and worked with the United States curling team for a long time and had quite a bit of success with, uh, with working with the Yankees. Uh, at the age of eight, he gave me a book called The Power of Positive Thinking by Norman Vincent Peale. And, um, that book is almost dangerous in the hands of an eight-year-old. Uh, I started to read it, and I believe that put in the, for, the foundation of, of looking for positivity uh, and, and working from a positive uh, foundation. So I've broken down this talk into really looking at there's, I feel there's two main coaching styles. And both of these coaching styles can win, except uh, the one on the left, the alpha female male. Uh, <clears throat> when it gets to the finish line and their success, we can look back and there's uh, many, there's dead bodies all over the place. It's, uh, it's not a very good relationship building style. Uh, and then with the alpha leader, uh, it's the coaching style that can also win and yet it builds destinies or i mean dynasties instead of just a, a one-off championship then the second piece is the coaching language is there a simple and easy and repeatable coaching language that actually generates results instead instead of possibly sabotaging success i've watched that happen before and um then uh 
We've got a process that I call it the STOP process. And uh, the STOP actually has an acronym. I'll go into it. But really, we're, we're, we just really stop. We can ask a quality question. And it, it's just, I, I believe it's as simple as just telling the player what to do and then reassuring him with uh, connected languages that we can be uh, better, we can be stronger, we, uh, we can be uh, successful, we can be winning. So it's uh, really to build this trust bond between the coach and the player that helps that player work through the various uh, barriers that he comes up against, he or she comes up against, so that, they, so that player can be the very best that they can be. Uh, the two coaching styles. Uh, the first is what I call a, an alpha female, alpha male. Now, there, Walt wanted me to add female into this, and I didn't have a female there before because I had, I had never had a female coach. So I'd recognized this in uh, the way men coach, but so I actually, uh, I legitimately couldn't add female in there because I didn't know if females actually coached this way. Um, but, uh, but, you know, we've added it and uh, we're going to run with it and, and uh, I guess get some feedback to see whether that's the case. But the way the alpha male coaches, it's actually a very, very simple coaching style. And uh, what happens is with this pyramid, the black one, uh, the, the alpha coach is right, or alpha female, alpha male is right at the very top of the pyramid. It's a very easy way to coach. And it's amazing how, like, there's been many coaches in the NHL uh, that have coached and they've been successful. And the way they do it is they just dump on the player. And that's why they're at the top and basically they just crap on the player. It's, a, it's actually such a simple style because all a person has to do is be negative and criticizing. And the, re the reason it works is that when the players are strong enough, they will win just to prove that coach was wrong and it's and it's the reason that it can typically win once and then the coach has to be replaced because the players play under this resentment this having they, they play under proving themselves and they basically after a while they play out of hate of that coach and that so what will happen is then they'll quit because they're unable to play uh, in that. And the irony is they may come back and say later that he was a really good coach, he really challenged us, he really that. And I think that in a way they do not believe it. Um, but they do say it just to be nice. So on the, and I could give some examples here, except you and I'm not. Because... Uh, <laughs> one of those coaches might actually be on the call with this and I, that would be rather maybe a little bit embarrassing. Uh, so on the right, <clears throat> I can give an example of an alpha leader coach and uh, in Calgary that was Bob Johnson. Bob Johnson, was, I think he said uh, a good day for hockey. He's a very, very positive man. And, um, and he actually put together a Flames team that beat uh, the most incredible Edmonds and Oilers team. Uh, Bob at the time, you know, they didn't win a Stanley Cup that year because Bob lacked a certain piece because the alpha leader, he, he's on the bottom. He lifts up the players. He does his very, very best to build their confidence, to be innovative, um, while the coach on the left is very, very restricted, uh, puts the players down. He's constantly building up the players. That's why he's at the bottom of this pyramid. And <clears throat> what will happen is, uh, even the players who aren't playing uh, will like him because he still works with them and helps to get have them be the very best that they can be. And uh, like Bob Johnson, he put together an amazing, uh, and he took on the Edmonton Oilers and beat them. I, I think it was the '85, 
and uh, they actually got the Oilers to shoot the puck into their own net in order to do it. 86. What oh, was it, 86? Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Just an amazing coach. And, and the irony was he didn't win the Stanley Cup that year because he hadn't really perfected the alpha leader coach style where it's 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 built around on relationships uh, and uh, and communication and building confidence and um, uh, transmitting belief. He also, after every once in a while, has to be able to read the riot act, I call it, in order to bring uh, the players, to get them all on the same page. And I think at that time he was sort of too good a guy and hadn't learned that. And then we moved on. He did win Stanley Cups, I believe, with Pittsburgh. And I believe he he learned how to master the alpha leader, has to master the alpha male piece to be able to use it once in a while in order to have the players all get on the same page and also have the players work through whatever fears they have in actually winning. And uh, yeah, so it's a very positive coaching style. It's, it's built on building players uh, instead of, uh, yeah, well, the alpha, uh, female, alpha, male is really just built on bashing e uh, a player's ego and hoping that they can work, work through it. And if they don't, the player just gets discarded. This read the riot act, it's, it's drawing a line in the sand. And, and every once in a while, a team will get into a place where even though they are ready to win, they are perhaps scared to win. And they will start self to self-sabotage. And so the alpha leader coach will identify that and he he will have to draw a line in the sand where everybody has to get on the same page or get on the same side of the room and it's a good exercise like i've actually done where i'm actually just drawn a line right down the middle of the floor and said hey uh for us to win everybody's got to get on on one side or the other and what does that look like and Morris, so it, excuse me morris uh Everyone except maybe Bob Lokes is coach female hockey. They're probably all alpha leader coaches. And I got a question for them. Uh, Matt, Tim, and Sammy, Tom, do you draw a line in the sand often with the girls? Matt? Yeah, I, I, I'm fascinating ch chat so far already, uh, Morris. Um, I think uh, I think early on I, I probably did it more than than I should have, and and uh, um, probably lost a few along the way. Um, so it's been a bit of a process, but um, I I, uh, I I kind of prefer this model where. Um, you know, I, I, I describe it as more of a, a, a servant leadership and I'm here for the athletes and um, and trying to, you know, build them up as much as possible. Um, but it is important. There are times. Yeah, there has to be a line in the sand, uh, whether it be um, effort or attitude. Um, you know, just from from myself personally, uh, my players have probably heard me yell at the entire team. Um you know, in the locker room or something like that, uh, from a negative perspective, a handful of times in the last five years. And that's when there's been a complete lack of effort or or uh, or something's gone on, a lack of respect for each other or for myself or my assistant coaches or for the refs. And uh, I need to sort of snap them back in line. So uh, when those occasions come and they're few and far between, thankfully, um, they certainly carry a little bit more weight. And uh, and I found that when, when you reserve it for those times, um, you know the players react. I think quite positively. They they, they realize that something's wrong, um, and they you know they I think they feed off that passion when you reach that point as a coach as well. Wow, that was beautiful. <laughs> I love the term servant leader, and I've heard it before. And uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna incorporate that into this message because it really is the cool thing about the alpha leader is it's of all about building up the players and the alpha female well alpha male i'm unsure about the alpha male female 
it's all it's just so much about the coach it's about him and his ego <clears throat> and he just hammers away on the players so interest the both can win and yet the servant alpha leader uh it builds it builds dynasties and uh and legends so um this is what i'm seeing now the, the other piece so that's the coaching style style there then there's the the message actually this being communicated and uh so the message what i'm seeing is There's a, just a fair amount of chaos that's going on. But really, if we look at the bottom line, the communication that's happening, and I've seen it, is it just it, it can cause chaos. <laughs> it, can, it can cause a frustration. And frustration, I'm convinced, it's an energy that attracts more to be frustrated about. And it can just spiral into a real chaos. And what's interesting, who made that last comment? Matt Holmberg. Matt? So it's real interesting, like how come the team went to that spot? And I'm convinced the team goes to that one spot where, and I love what was said, uh, snap them back, snap them back in. It's a, or, And it's kind of like wake them up because they, they, they kind of go into a place where there's almost like a fear of possibly being the very best that they can be. And there's almost like a self-sabotage that goes on and the, and the coach it's his job at that time to have them buy into a different situation that's uh, that's going to be very bad. So uh, the power of languaging. I, uh, there's sort of a danger in coaching. And the danger is that, is that the players might actually be listening to what we're saying, and which is a bit of an irony. I mean, because as coaches, we would all be hoping that they're listening to what we're saying. So my thought is we, it would be best for us to be saying and speaking in a powerful way that helps empower their success. And what I've seen is too often the language confuses the player or it can cause uh, uh, low self-esteem problems or shame or guilt feelings, which all disempower success. Um, respect and trust is so important in the player-coach uh, relationship. Uh, and improper languaging actually destroys uh, the respect and the trust. And like I've said, there's so often, and we could throw the, the word parent in here, player and parent relationship. Because I've seen where dads have so empowered their their son, which is I primarily with improper languaging that the the boy will actually shut down. He almost goes into a, a paralysis where his performance is so so low that um, uh, and it's actually very easy to fix. Morris, I got a question. Yeah. Uh, when you you said uh, you know you referred to the boy and the parent, and we've had two authors on uh, Allison Tufts and Angie Abdu, uh, who are f female mums of boys playing hockey. Uh, my question uh, was, uh, what you may you the story of parents affecting the players and, and them shutting down. Can anybody, Kim, can you comment on that? Is that happening on the female side? You're coaching junior girls, and uh, is there anybody interfering with them to that degree? Um, there might be, but it's rare that the player will communicate it in that way or that I would see it. So, you know, less of the destructive screaming, <laughs> banging on the glass. I have I think Mom, in is that your girls had two parents like that who have that? demonstrably, um, you know, shown me that they may be sabotaging their daughter in that way. Um, but I do think uh, 
if if it was happening, I don't know that the girls are necessarily sharing that with me. Um, a lot of the time, a lot of the girls, it's their own expectations that they're challenging to live up to. And, and that often the feedback I hear from the players and parents is that the, the child's expectations are so extraordinarily high for themselves that they're hard to meet. And, and I think that's um, quite common in the female game, especially at the level I'm coaching at or, or Matt or, or Tom is coaching at. Um, you know, they're, they're their own uh, worst enemy as opposed to the parents. But again, that's that's my experience. It may be different. I've not coached at younger levels or lower levels, so I'm not sure if it's different there. Any other uh, people in the female coaching business can comment on that? Well, do you think that there do you think that there's a difference in how the parents react by virtue of the fact that there aren't million dollar contracts for females at the end of the day? Mm, interesting. Their their deal is a scholarship though. Right. Yeah, and and that's still that's still obviously you know, has value and is very important. I just wonder I, I just wonder if that, that, that may account for part of it. Um, I think you're I, right, Matt. I think that this generation of parent, um, while that's changing and the you know expectations now are starting to be similar for their young daughter and their, your, their young son in terms of life goals. But I would say for the most part, there's still, um, you know, the prevalency of you do think of diff you have different expectations for your daughter and your uh, son. And so we see that with the majority of parents as well, I, I would say. That's my thought. Well, I mean, don't get me wrong. I've been at thousands of minor hockey games <laughs> uh, in Toronto. Uh, girls, I don't watch a lot of boys games. And there are a lot of the quote unquote crazy parents who are, you know, voicing their concerns quite openly to everybody. And I always said an easy way to fix the parent problem would be to make them wear the jersey of their kid. Uh, you know, like if they're the home team, make them wear the away, so we all know who they're who they're representing. Um, but it it is it is there in the female game, and it is typically the the males, like the the fathers. Um, but that you know, typically more of them are at the games, um, so it's not um, invisible. But uh, I just personally haven't seen it with the teams I'm coaching quite as much. Um, but it is definitely there. And I know that at my hockey school, because I run a hockey school that has kids of all levels on the ice at the same time, and I really try to stress fun, but we do have Olympians coaching them. Um, often parents will bring their kids in and see other kids that aren't as strong on the ice and um, be very forceful with my <coughs> instructors, telling them, that this isn't right, you know, yelling at my instructors. Um, so I've had, I've certainly had that. I've had parents take their kids out of my camp because they feel like they should only be with elite kids. So there is the starting to be, I think you're right, Matt, with the, there isn't the million dollar contract at the end, but there is starting to be way more opportunities for girls that these parents are seeing for, you know, living, as we all say, you're living vicariously through your kids. They certainly, there certainly is that. And I do see that at camp. Just probably not as much as the men's game. Yeah, it's a good point. I mean, we're, we're all of us involved in in the women's game are pushing for that, right? To to have that uh, that option, I guess. And so we'll see what that brings with it in terms of the parents. I, I can, by way of anecdote, I can honestly say that in 12 years as head coach at Queens, I've had one parent um, actively question me about about ice time. Um, and so I don't know. If that's just because, you know, other than playing for a national team, the university levels, the top level and parents are, are happy once they get there, if they've left home uh, at that point and, and aren't in contact with uh, their child as much. Um, it was a 30 second conversation, mind you. But um, I so I've always wondered what it's like maybe down at, um, you know, in minor hockey uh, with the parents. But uh, certainly at uh, in my experience, anyway, at the university level, the, the parents um are not really a factor in a negative uh, way. Matt, I just wanted to, Saul has put his hand up a couple times. Uh, when I talked to Sal, uh, Saul last week, I mentioned the nature of this presentation, knowing the audience and knowing Morris. And uh, Saul, you've been listening and you had your finger up there wanting to say a few words. And I'm wondering if you can connect this, the uh, 
I think Sammy's point and Tom's point about scholarships, there is a serious goal, financial goal, that's affecting parents, that affects players, that really puts pressure on coaches. So Saul, go ahead. If you've got any comments to make, please. Well, make a comment more about the parents putting pressure on their their kids, um, and certainly um, parents put pressure on their daughters. Um, I don't think it's quite as much as we see with them putting pressure on their sons, but in different sports. I mean, I'm just finishing a book now on golf and one of the people I used to work with uh, years ago was Nancy Lopez who was a great golfer and Nancy has had several daughters and uh, is a wonderful person and she was telling me that looking at the game now um, what Nancy was saying that was she noticed now on the PGA Tour that some of the parents were on the LPGA tour. Some of the parents were very, very hard on their, on their kids, on their girls. And so it's, I think as well as opportunity for significant gain, the assertive and aggressive, but it's what, my experience is it's been more directed at the daughter than it is at the coach. And that's, you know, I haven't had, I worked with Canadian women's soccer team and um, I didn't, at that level, I didn't see any parents at all. I mean, these women were, um, but anyway, um, so I, I just wanted to say, and, and Nancy pointed out to me that she thought there was a cultural factor in it that um, Oriental parents were very hard on their girls. Very much more harder on their girls, I shouldn't say. Uh, it's interesting. I know in skating, the same thing, where there have been parents very hard on their daughters, who were daughters they were pushing to excel at the highest level. So we're talking where there's significant gain, whether you're talking about scholarships or people participating in professional sport like golf or being a potential Olympian. So um, vision is the first point. And it's about true north. It's about the having that compass. Uh, pointing true north and having everybody on the same page. And uh, this really started for me with uh, Pat Clinton. I played for Pat in L.A., and Pat was a very smart man. Actually, Saul uh, also worked with us with the L.A. Kings, so he had some experience with Pat. Um, and Pat, I loved Pat as a coach. He was very much an alpha leader coach, I got to admit, he could sure read the riot act when it was required. And when he always came from a who we are, what we believe, what we do. And, uh, and uh, like context, context is like the warrior's cry. Uh, it delivers certainty. And so Pat talked in an inclusive language of who we are what we believe, what we do. I believe this is very, very, very important because the more that the word, so I, I love we, us, our, that language, who we are, we're all, uh, we're, we're in this together. So we, us, our, our plan. The, the more often you is used, that the word you actually causes more and more separation and, uh, and uncertainty. So standard of excellence, this is just a quick thing. I've just noticed with any rules, like I, I, I have zero rules. I put in standards of excellence. And as soon as rules are put in place, I've noticed that there's something in human nature that there's a resistance that comes up. 
and it's almost whether it's the self-sabotaging ego at work but it's amazing how often rules get broken like every team i played with where we have had a list of rules didn't matter which professional team somewhere along the line those rules got broken and every rule got broken and it, so i've got rid of rules because i feel it just it, it's uh rules are a uh, a road to failure so I throw in standards of excellence, and I believe that's what we're constantly looking at, is is seeing how we can get our game to higher and higher levels of excellence. And at the bottom, ownership, uh, accountability, responsibility. All those contribute to standards of excellence. So rules, my thought is chuck them out. I believe this is uh, the biggest stumbling block in languaging. Saul and I talked about this probably 15 years ago. Uh, and um, and I believe that uh, Saul has bought into the idea. The word negative languaging, like don't do, uh, confuses the mind. And uh, what happens is negative languaging actually goes to a part of the brain that has nothing to do with muscle movement. So when we say don't talk back to the referee, it is amazing how somebody goes and talks back to the referee. Don't retaliate. This and somebody else will immediately. The very first time I saw this and where I really it got my attention was uh, with Coach Tom Watt in Winnipeg. We loved Tom. We had one of the worst teams ever in the history of the NHL. We, we didn't win for 35 games in a row. Sadly, we, we had to fire our coach, Tom McVie. And uh, it ended up that uh, in the end, Tom came along. And Tom ended up being coach of the year. We were the most improved team ever in the history of the NHL. I believe a 46 point improvement from one year to the next. And it was only because we had such a horrible year the year before. that it, So we had this improvement. So we loved Tom. And uh, every once in a while, his mom liked the grandstand. And he got on the bench one time. We had just taken a very bad penalty against the Calgary Flames. And he stood on the bench. And uh, he put his arms up in the air and he yelled as loud as he could, like everybody in the rink could hear it. He said, don't take any more stupid penalties. And he yelled this out. And I can remember looking at him standing up on the bench and hearing him say this. And, and I was thinking, wow, he's really, he's into this game. And uh, it ends up that they, the face off was right in front of our bench. They dropped the puck and literally Dougie Smale reached over and slashed the guy. And now we were two men short. And, uh, it was amazing how quickly this negative languaging will backfire. And so, uh, like, I've seen it all sorts of times in the dressing room. The coach comes in and says, hey, guys, defenseman, never, never pass that puck across the front of our net. Literally, as soon as we get on the ice, the defenseman will pass it across, normally right onto one of their guys' the sticks. And the puck goes into our net so fast, and we all stand there and look at each other. And, um, like, what's going on? So it's... Um, the negative languaging is just it's a self sabotaging so my thought is go with like instead of and, and a very very important thing is the word no no like no more giveaways uh, no more stupid penalties the mind actually can interpret it as in k n o w and so the player will actually continue to give the puck away because especially if he respects and trusts the coach, he actually hears no. So he's got to actually give the puck away as many ways as he can so he can actually know it. And uh, so I've eliminated the word no from my language. And uh, instead, the key word, I believe, is to use stop. Hey, let's stop this the mind it's amazing there are stop signs all over the place just get out and drive down the street and we'll see stop 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 all over the place um, so stop is a so much more effective word and i actually use it as a piece of my correcting process so it's just stop and do this and in my correction in correcting mistakes Go with three alternatives. So, hey, we're going to, hey, player, uh, uh, Michael, 
we're stopping giving the puck away. What we're, what we're going to do is we're going to chip the puck out, we're going to pass the puck out, or we're going to skate the puck out. Normally, the mind will catch one of those three, and it'll improve the import, uh, performance. Can't, my gosh. How can we ever have success using the word can't? Um, uh, so I replaced with positive languaging, and I used the word stop in order to transition from a, what, a situation. Instead of saying don't do, I say stop this. We're going to do this. And reinforce it three times in a row so the player can get it. Uh, the danger of but. Uh, I love you, but, oh my gosh, the but just negated whatever was said before. So, uh, I love you and I believe in you also. So, replace but with the word and. Uh, correcting mistakes. Uh, I like this, Wally's helped me with this, is that Wally has introduced the idea of going from yelling to telling to actually asking a quality question. And asking a question to a player is very, very important because the, qu the question though, why did you do that, can be demeaning and cause low self-esteem and shame. So instead, I basically I've eliminated the why from my crash quality question. I'll ask um, uh, Sam, uh, what did you see on that play? And so I'm asking for an exchange of information instead of there's a question that can be asked here that will cause the player to become defensive. Why did you do that? As soon as that question is asked, the exchange of communication stops and the player then gets into a defending himself and defending his actions and it's it's it, it, so then it's very difficult to actually correct the mistake then uh, so it's uh, it becomes very important to ask a good question then a quality question and there's a cool saying uh, is the quality of our lives are based on the quality of the questions we ask so it's very important for a coach to learn what's the quality question and I love this one, like, how can I help in this situation? Because now it's asking for an exchange from the player. Also, what I'll do sometimes, I'll go in and I'll ask the player, uh, can I ask, uh, Sam, can I ask you a question right now? I'll ask for permission first. And then that way, when he says, well, sure. And sometimes the player might not be ready. He might say no. So there's, there's different areas there in correcting mistakes. Um, so I gave that about giving uh, three times. And it's very important about us keeping the player in the zone. If we actually get the player thinking too much, it takes them out of the zone. So whenever I'm finished correcting the mistake, I always give the player a pat on the back. Uh, I find it most effective on the right side <clears throat> because it actually gets them back out of their thinking and moves them into more of their being. Uh, at the bottom, when a player keeps making a mistake over and over, and even with good correcting, he continues to make the mistake, then typically there's a low self-esteem issue, and or he could be getting information from his dad uh, or mom uh, that is uh, causing this situation to happen over and over. I've helped many, many dads have a good relationship with their, especially with their sons, by coaching them on this languaging. Uh, this word here, the word need, like I really, for my players uh, and for myself, I really am interested in creating abundance. Need is a scarcity word. We need a better power play creates more of the need for a better power play. It is it is a dangerous word. So I've replaced need with right at the bottom is that we have a better power play. We can have a better power play. We will have a better power play. By the way, can denotes capability, will denotes commitment. So hey, we can have a better power play. We will have a better power play. We'll have a better power play.
And it's just so much more powerful. I just listen to society need, need, need. And it's incredible. It just need people who are in need are people who have bought into a scarcity mindset. And it just creates more of the need. Uh, the universe is always listening. So it's very, very important for us to be careful of what we actually put into the universe because it's going to have to come back to us. And um, so uh, it's just the way, it, it's just really the way the universe works. Uh, owning. Ownership is so important. And I love this. Uh, this was something that Wally or uh, or Ryan Hilderman came up or uh, perhaps Tim Bothwell is transmit belief. So constantly, it's our responsibility to help as, as an alpha leader coach is to build confidence. It's interesting, uh, the alpha male his, feels his responsibility is to constantly challenge and put down the player. Uh, I, would I, I would much rather build up the player and help him learn how to get through what are obst whatever obstacles are in the player's way. Um, so the player, it's interesting, the players quite often will actually talk from a third person. And I'm convinced that speaking from, so when you get an opportunity to get into the play and you get this puck right in front of the net and then you decide to shoot high, uh, I feel the player is actually talking from a, the third entity, which I believe is the ego. And the player does that in order to protect himself because if it doesn't work out, then instead of him being at fault, he can actually blame the third party or the third party can be blamed. So it's a very, very deep thing. So I encourage players and actually Tony Robbins um, reinforces this in his talks is to come from the eye. So instead of instead of saying, so when you get the puck in front of the net, and the player's actually talking about himself here, is when you get the puck, and when you do this, and when you do that, and instead of, say, when I get the puck in front of the net, and when I'm figuring out the goal, and when I'm shooting the puck high, so what happens, the I, or the I am, increases ownership. Uh, together, I have done my best to eliminate uh, you language. You cause this separation between the coach and the player. As often as possible, I come back to we, us, our. If I actually, like, I, it's interesting. I listen to coaches give their pep talk before a game in the dressing room. And uh, they'll go, hey, we're, this is our plan. This is what we're doing. The, uh, we're going to, we, we'll, we'll get them tonight. And then at the end, he says, okay, you guys, you're ready. And so right at the last moment, right before the players go on the ice, he has now separated himself and actually has communicated. He has really doesn't believe in his own plan. You guys is dangerous. Sometimes when, when I'm talking to the player, if I'm addressing that player and we're, I, the word you is required, I will actually say, um, what did you, Sam, what did you, Matt, what did you, uh, Rebecca, what did you, uh, Sandy, see on that play? Because I want to, I'm interested in increasing uh, uh, togetherness and inclusiveness. You destroys that. Uh, shaming and blaming. You should have. Oh my gosh, how dangerous. A beautiful book to read, Power Versus Force by David Hawkins. Uh, just a really good book to read. In the back of the book, it actually has a, a scale that goes from zero to a thousand about the frequency of words. It is interesting. The words that will inflict guilt and shame, doubt and blame, and those are the killers of the of the warrior. There's a saying, what kills the warrior? 
And the answer is doubt. It increases ownership. Uh, together, I have done my best to eliminate uh, you language. You cause this separation between the coach and the player. As often as possible, I come back to we, us, our. If I actually, like, I, it's interesting. I listen to coaches give their pep talk before a game in the dressing room. And uh, they'll go, hey, we're, this is our plan. This is what we're doing. Uh, we're going to... We, we'll, we'll get him tonight. And then at the end, he says, okay, you guys, you're ready. And so right at the last moment, right before the players go on the ice, he has now separated himself and actually has communicated. He has really doesn't believe in his own plan. You guys is dangerous. You, uh, actually, got uh, got Don Cherry fired from uh, TV. Um, so that's how dangerous it is. So if, when... It, Sometimes when I'm talking to the player, if I'm addressing that player and where I, the word you is required, I will actually say, um, what did you, Sam, what did you, Matt, what did you, uh, Rebecca, what did you, uh, Sandy, see on that play? Because I want to, I'm interested in increasing uh, uh, togetherness and inclusiveness. You destroys that. Uh, shaming and blaming. <sighs> you should have. Oh my gosh, how dangerous. What kills the warrior? And the answer is doubt. On the field of play, the warrior has, it's important for the warrior to be 100% certain. As soon as doubt or possibly guilt where shame come in, the, the warrior gets killed. I've reflected on why is there this negative language? And if we're really interested in being positive, and we're interested in being positive coaches, where does this negative languaging come in? And so I actually originally thought that it was languaging that came in from about, about the 40s, 50s, 60s. And it was a languaging that was given to the baby boomers from uh, from a don't do uh, parenting because it was sort of the idea at the time don't do but I've actually sh shifted away from that and I believe what happens it's a languaging that can be learned by children uh, and it's given to them by overwhelmed parents is the child it's amazing when the child gets moving and running around and everywhere the parent resorts to don't touch that hot stove. Uh, don't pull out the cat's hair. Uh, don't because they're they're overwhelmed and it's a quick fix. And so what happens is the child actually gets the languaging. So uh, I believe this would be amazing for parents because right from the start when the child is doing something, it would be to go over and say, oops, Johnny, let's stop this. What we're going to do is we're going to be nice to the cat. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to pet the cat and what we're going to do is we're going to listen to the cat purr and those three things will then get the, the child to actually leave the cat alone i really believe that this can work um constrictive languaging i've watched this it's a languaging that can be used once in a while like when the game goes into overtime in the seventh game like we have to win we have to get that next goal Yet when it's used over and over and over, it will actually disempower performance because, it, like, actually just feel it. You have to win. You, you've got to. It actually, right away, even when I say that, my hands get tenser. And uh, what happens is, so I, I eliminate the have to, got to. I will only use it when it's absolutely critical. Otherwise, I just keep it saying, hey, we love to win. Uh, we love to uh, get the puck out. We love to uh, finish the plays. Love, uh, actually, from Hawkins' book, it is the highest, highest 
frequency word in uh, the English language. Yeah, so use open and encouraging coaching language in both words and in tone. It's amazing how negative tone can cause just as much as the words don't, can't, won't. So tone is important. And it's our job to inspire players. And we can do that through uh, encouraging tone. And then in languaging, like I, I do as often as possible, we'll use the player's name. In, or if I have to use use, I will say, what did you, James, see in that play? Also, once in a while, uh, I'll, I'll uh, utter, I will just throw Morris in. I believe that, it, or I, maybe I'll, I'll put Mr. in. I think so every once in a while, co players like something different. It kind of uh, catches them. So sometimes I'll, I'll just address them by Mr. Miller. Uh, or I'll just throw in, hey, Miller, how are you today? And then most important, well, actually, uh, also important is that when a player does something amazing, is have a nickname for every one of the players. And uh, like, uh, let's say, like Howard Chuck was Ducky. And uh, so when he, when he would do something amazing, like as a teammate, I would go over and I would, and I would just, you know, I'd go, Ducky, amazing play. And also, so that was between teammates. Yet between player and coach, when we use the player's nickname in this situation, when there's a celebration or there's a, a praise, it creates, it just helps solidify the trust bond between the player and the coach. I find it's one of the best ways to build a relationship is to use the player's nickname when uh, something is done right. <clears throat> when something is done incorrectly uh, i will always use what did you saw see in that play uh coaching in the zone morris, morris. yeah it's sorry to interrupt you um i think really some interesting stuff on your linguistics uh a number of years ago i was coaching a team and um we like to use the nicknames and uh, it was actually our general manager came to me and, and he said to me, uh, he thought that it was too familiar for a coach to use nicknames or what have you. And there should be um, that space, which sort of speaks to your separation point. Can you comment on that? So the general manager, who, who's asking the question, please? That's uh, Malcolm. Okay, Malcolm. And uh, so the general general manager did not like the use of nicknames no he he felt that as a coaching staff we were we were too familiar with the, the players there was too we were too close um and there had to be separation between um you know the coaches and the players to uh i guess uh build respect of course you know based on what you've been describing and and it confirms my methodology i I uh, disagreed, uh, but ultimately to our peril because we weren't we weren't back the following year. I just I just wondered if you or maybe others had uh, had some experience with that because it's it's sort of the new mindset versus kind of an old old mindset in terms of coaching. My thought is that the coach or the, the general manager, possibly an alpha male and wasn't open to innovative ways of coaching. He probably was, he had been given a guideline of how it was supposed to be. And uh, yeah, yeah so in fact, his, his language was, uh, you can't be their friends. Yeah, what bullshit that is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thanks. Morris, it's Kim. I just wanted to add one piece there. I think it's a great question, Malcolm. And I, I find in minor hockey, um, often you get players for multiple years and 
I've tried consciously to not use nicknames early on uh, because I find it the players who are new to your team uh, feel, and they've actually expressed this to me, that it, it, it makes them feel like like you already have an in with that player. Like, um, so if I, you know, I have some players I've got seven nicknames for because I've coached them for four years. If I have a new player coming in and I just, you know, we haven't worked to that yet, it is initially um, maybe not great from a team culture or making people feel welcome and included. So I usually, you know, throughout training camp, try not to use them, which is quite hard, especially if you've had a kid you've coached for four years and you almost exclusively call them by their nickname. But I, I do think there's a place for a little bit of more of that formality, I guess, uh, early on um, to make sure that no one is feeling excluded by not having a nickname yet that the coach calls them. So that's only something I, I started to switch around in the last couple of years. But um, that that actually came from the players themselves saying that it it made them feel um, not as included early on. Kim, thank you so much. What a beautiful comment. Like you've just taken this talk to a whole new level. I mean, I'm going to use that uh, because I can see that it uh, when we're attempting to create togetherness and then all of a sudden the newer player feels like he's on the outside because the nickname isn't being used or yeah. So um, I like that. Morris, the start of the season. For a sec. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, it's Rick. It's Rick Puttick. Uh, just further to Kim's comment, I, I've actually for a long time fostered uh, the use of nicknames, the development of positive nicknames very early in the process to be more inclusive. Right on. I can see where uh, Kim knows coming from that from the start. Yeah, for you sure. You have everybody on the same level field, use everybody's first names and then incorporate nicknames as we go along because nicknames will develop trust. It will develop uh, like on every pro team I played with, I, it was rare that I ever actually called a guy by his first name. It was always, we had nicknames for each other. And I'll tell you what, there's some funny nicknames that come up. And we're like, like we called Dave Christian, you know, he played with the 1980 uh, uh, U.S. Miracle on Ice team. When he came to Winnipeg, we ended up nicknaming.